precision agriculture and automation technologies for specialty crop production management. And uh, as I told in the beginning, the speaker is Dr. Lab R. Khot, uh, who is an associate professor in the Department of Biological System Engineering, Washington State University. He is one of the core faculty members of Washington State University's Center for Precision and Automated Agriculture System. And uh, he received his uh, ME from AIT and MS from Iowa State University and PhD from North Dakota State University. A very learned person. He is associated with American Society of Agricultural and Biological Engineers, you know, both with the transaction of uh, Asabe and he chairs the mechanization, digitization, sensing, and robotics work group of International Society of Articultural Sciences. A very learned person and a hard worker. And I request Dr. Love uh, to speak on this very important topic. Dr. Love, please. Thank you, Dr. Mani. Um, good afternoon or good evening to all of you. This is very good, very early morning for me. Well, I woke up at uh, four to get here, but uh, anyway. I'm hoping that um, before my kids wake up, I get this through. So, <laughs> um, yeah, that's my worry because at 6:37 they are up and they will be making noise here. So, um, um, I see Mr. Setu is in charge of uh, forwarding slides. Um, yeah. Okay. Good. Um, so today, um, for next 25 or 30 minutes, I'm talking. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of the advances in the technology domain, uh, uh, which can be used um, to grow what is called specialty crops a little bit better than what we used to, right? And um, the reason I have chosen the, the topic of uh, covering specialty crops is because that's what um, majorly what is grown in the state of Washington State. Here and again, this Washington State is different than Washington D.C. We are Seattle, uh, Pacific Coast, uh, this area here, right? So next slide, please. So I want to start by uh, defining what is specialty crops, right? Um, well, one, oh, this side, yeah, okay. So um, as per USDA, the specialty crops are defined as something that is fruits or vegetables. Uh, for example, apples, cherries, pear uh, that we grow in Washington state, especially crops. We also grow onion, potato, carrots. Those are also specialty crops. And, and uh, if you go to central part of Washington, what you see here is the, the map of Washington state. Um, uh, as you cross the mountains from Seattle side and you come to central part of Washington, um, we have like a huge irrigated agriculture and that's where we grow all these crops. And our Center for Precision Agriculture is located uh, there at Prosser. And um, some of us are tasked to work in this, um, you know, in these crops to develop technologies to um, address several issues, uh, which I'm going to talk in in next few slides. So next slide, please. Um, I think, um, you know, because the webinar series is going on, and I'm not sure somebody covered this domain or not, but for next few slides, I'll just quickly run through um, what is precision agriculture and um, what some, some of the landscape of the technology that is uh, emerging in this domain, but very briefly, because I think uh, in 25 minutes, we need to cover a lot. So um, again, a simple definition of precision agriculture is producing more with less, and you can make it you know, a very complicated definition as well, but um, my program uh, focuses on precision agriculture, and I have modified this a little bit more to say producing more with less for healthy beings. Uh, it's not about more the quantity, but the quality that we produce, uh, specifically when it comes to producing, you know, fresh market uh, crop like apple or sweet cherries. Um, and there are several issues um, for the crop that we grow for fresh market. A very good example is, you know, we are worried about pesticide residues on the crop. Um, we produce, we put more pesticides to control pests and disease, but the MRLs uh, dictate, um, you know, how much residue can be on the fruit or produce, but um, still growers are emotional about applying chemicals and control pests. And that's where the health aspect uh, kind of goes in the vein. And so whatever we do uh, through Prishnak Technologies has to not only to produce more, but to produce something that um, makes the, the community a little bit healthy. And that's what my program focuses on. 
So what you see here is uh, the the circle of Krishna agriculture, and uh, the in the nutshell, it's 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 two things. We measure the variability, the soil, crop, everything using georeference sensors, and then we manage it because everything georeference, we know the variability. We manage it using the technology, what's called variable rate technology. And then we look at how we did, and then we keep repeating this, right? So next slide, please. And again, um, we always need some something new, some facelift, right? And that's why we have now transformed from what's called Krishna agriculture to digital agriculture. So it's nothing but using more sensors, more data, more data analytics in this uh, in this domain uh, to make a little bit, um, uh, you know, decision making and, and management a little bit real time. Next slide, please. Um, and again, if you break the dig dig digital agriculture as defined by FAO, um, and if you look at the Krishna agriculture, the, to the core, it's it's a three basic things. We have to measure and we have to analyze and we have to manage. Now, um, again, it's done through use of, uh, you know, a um, lot more sensors than we used to. Um, a very good example is when the, the concept of Krishna agriculture came in, we had the satellites, Landsat 7 or 8, uh, taking uh, images at 30 meter per pixel resolution. Now, as of today, we have uh, satellites, low orbiting satellites uh, circling around the globe. Every other day, we are getting uh, images in point, you know, five me 0.5 meter or say three meter resolution and something like this. So, and then that data, again, we can analyze a little bit better and do management through like, you know, automated systems. And that's what the digital agriculture or smart agriculture is. Uh, next slide, please. And so my program then, you know, kind of um, use any of these um, blocks that are, that are seen here. We do measurement, we do analytics, and we do management, right? And again, my focus of my presentation and my research group in, in uh, Washington State here is to work on irrigated agricultural crops, for example, apples, cherries, pear, grapes, um, and, and some of these high value crops. Um, one thing that I wanted to point out here is um, just like um, any other place, you have program and then you have projects. So uh, you write the proposal and uh, in US we have federal agency, what is called USDA or NSF, and then you, you get funding and then your program as the blocks are there will gain some strength in some area because there's more funding coming in that area and such. So you will see um, later in the presentation, a lot of my projects are in the management side where we want to develop some technologies to manage the crop inputs. Um, but I'm going to touch base on me measurement and analytics as well, because that's important part of Krishna agriculture. So next slide, please. So we'll focus on uh, the technology landscape for measurement and very briefly, next slide, please. Um, this is remote sensing, I'll skip this, uh, but what we are sensing is abiotic and biotic stress. Uh, you probably know all this, so I'm going to skip all this. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and then what we need for sensing or monitoring the crop uh, variability or crop stress is we need platforms, we need sensors, and we need data analytics engine that could be in-house or that could be on the cloud, right? Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of platforms, we have um, maybe a lot of discussion already on the drones. Um, we have the automated systems, like for example, we have the tractor or some other um, platforms going in the field. And as they're applying some crop input, they can also do sensing aspect, right? And then uh, in today's world, uh, we, are, we are seeing a lot more in terms of what remote sensing, the low orbiting satellite based remote, based remote sensing can do. There are several players here. What is shown is Planet. There is Airbus, a company who manufactures the, the uh, airplanes in U Europe and, and so, other, so many other players um, in California uh, they are launching range of satellites. Um, and then, you know, you're getting the data, as I said, at 0.5 meter per pixel resolution in, in multispectral domain that can be used to understand the crop variability and such. So there are several platforms uh, that use these optical sensors and which I have summarized in next slide. Um, yeah, can you go next slide, please? Yeah. Next slide, please. Yeah, 
So this is the summary of all the optical sensors that um, are available for doing sensing using the platforms that I showed before. And this is just shows the progression. You know, um, again, we don't need to spend a whole lot here. Uh, as you can see, you know, previously, if you go out um, to do some sightseeing and everything, you used to carry the point and shoot cameras or film cameras. Now, because of the CMOS sensor, um, we have this, you know, smartphones taking very crisp images, and the same thing goes on the drone and and satellite um, platforms. We have domain of what is called multispectral sensor, uh, where we have about three to ten optical bands um, that are, you know, integrated uh, to get, you know. RGB and some of the uh, domain of um, up to 1000 nanometers because that's where the cost of detectors goes higher and you cannot integrate in a small form factor. So those platforms, th those sensors are available for doing um, multispectral imaging. You get NDVI and, and so many other indices uh, to get the crop variability. Now, domain of hyperspectral imaging is widely you know, um, debated and I would say abused uh, because, um, uh, you know, in the, in the hyperspectral domain, for example, uh, you have more than 100 or so bands and you get a very narrow bandwidth specific spectral signature. But when it comes to agriculture, you change the crop or you change, the, you have the same crop and you go different location, the spectral signature will change. And, and I have seen several uh, studies out there, um, uh, you know, you, you say that you detect something here and if you, if, if you apply same thing somewhere else, the spectral signature will change. And um, another issue that is there with hyperspectral sensor is the His voice is lost. <laughs> yeah, he'll come back, he'll wait, I think. He's still on. His network is on, I think Mike must have. Someone needs to WhatsApp him or something like that. that uh, yeah, I think Mike must have. Uh, Sir, his mic is on. Have. Can someone inform him? Yeah, I, I can call him right now. I'm just calling him. Ah, please, please. He's not picking up. Uh, let me text him. Can you hear love? Yeah, I no love. Yeah. We cannot hear. Now he's not speaking. He knows that he's not being heard. Okay, um, Doctor Indramani, we wait for a minute. Otherwise, okay. we give. Yeah, we we get the next speaker. Then he when he comes, he can join after the next speaker. Continue. No, just he's picking up the call. Yeah. Okay, okay, good. You can make sign so that you can see somebody suggests, but I don't know how to. His phone might have been muted. Uh, he, he, he just picked up my phone and he's trying to set his mic. He just. 
Yeah, yeah, just, yeah. Now I just spoke to him. Yeah. Yeah, I'm seeing him. Okay. Okay. Good. Great. So now his video is gone. <laughs> no, I can see his video. Yeah. I okay. can see him. Okay. Doctor Lau, we cannot hear you. Your mic can is I a hear, problem. Can you? Yeah. Now oh. I can hear you. Now I can hear. Thanks. Oh, sorry. So I don't know where yeah. I lost the track no, here. Uh, so you start from uh, advances in optical senses. Please go back one slide. Yeah. From <laughs> here. Uh, please, please. Sorry, because okay. you cannot. No, hear that's you. fine. Um, I don't know what was the issue. Um, no. so um, what I'm trying to show here, uh, in a nutshell, is there's there are a lot of uh, advances that has happened uh, in in the domain of optical sensing, and um, a simple example is if you you know uh, go back uh, ten years back you go out for sightseeing you take up like you know what is called you know point and shoot camera to take pictures with the film and everything now you have your smartphone uh, that takes very crisp images thanks to the advances in CMOS technology um, and then that same thing miniaturization and um, all these things to detectors has translated to you know uh, drone based RGB imaging or satellite based uh, sensing right. So going from RGB, we have multispectral and hyperspectral where we can, you know, have, uh, let's say in multispectral, we have up to 10 bands, up to 1000 nanometer. Um, uh, and you can send some things like NDVI and some other vegetation indices and see crop stress. Uh, in hyperspectral, you can um, uh, probably, you know, um, do a little bit more bands. Uh, the issue that is with hyperspectral is two things, the payload and the cost. Uh, so for aerial platforms, um, you know, you have six thousand or seven thousand dollar drone, and you have forty five thousand dollar camera. And and in in U.S. agriculture, for example, if you have to image two hundred acres, um, you are going to get drone based imaging for about ten minutes. You're you're going to get like one acre or so covered, and and that's not feasible for at least U.S. agriculture, right? So it's good for research tool, but again, when it comes to applying in agriculture, you have to go to you know multi spectral domain, right? Um, then in terms of thermal imaging, and there are a lot of advancements, uh, you can get a thermal imaging sensor, um, you know, that you can connect to a smartphone for about $400 and take thermal uh, images. What are those is you get an image in each pixel is a temperature value. And if it's a radiometric calibrated imager, then you get, you know, temperature of soil and plant and everything. And again, um, as you, you know, you, if you want more resolution and better detectors, the cost goes up to say about $10,000. The better ones are about 40,000, but they're lab grade. But for drones and, and other app, like aerial sensing, you can get about 7,000 or $10,000 sensor that can do the job, right? Then in terms of canopy mapping and, and plant height and some other measurements, we can also use LIDAR, light detection and ranging. Uh, there can be 2D or 3D. 3Ds are still coming to the market uh, in a little bit rudimentary format and a lot need to be done there um, in terms of, you know, uh, miniaturization and, uh, and other, other aspects, right? And there's always something new. Uh, for example, last one, what I'm showing here is a combo of multispectral thermal imaging, right? And it's a very light payload that you can put on the drone and, and, and take the multispectral and thermal imaging of your field, right? So next slide, please. Um, again, as I said before, um, let's not restrict ourselves to drones or any other aerial ground-based aerial platform. Um, we have a lot, um, more going on in the um, aerial domain, what is called low orbiting domain. Uh, there's a company called Planet, uh, there's you know Airbus, they are launching the low orbiting satellites and we are getting resolution down to like say three meter or 0.5 meter. And they are circling the globe every other day or every day for it, for that matter. Um, I was just on a call yesterday and, and we are scheduling, um, you know, the images of your our research plots um, for the days that we want and things like that. So um, that domain, um, I think we should look at in terms of um, using that remote sensing data to understand the variability and, and manage it, manage our farms a little bit better. So next slide, please. Yeah, and, and I talked about this. This is uh, coming from Airbus, right? And, and, and they are in the business of launching satellites and collecting optical imagery. So yeah, that's a good news for agriculture. Um, and this is just showing the resolution aspect. You know, previously, for example, if you see the top left side, we had a Landsat image, um, 30 meter per pixel. And in the US, most of the crops that like potatoes or carrots or vegetable crops, um, um, mint and some other crops, they are grown in circles, right? 
And what, you know, what it is, is a circle that is about 130 acre. And then uh, we have this, you see the irrigation uh, pivot that goes and applies the water, right? Um, at uh, mid elevation or high elevation, or sometimes now we're like you know, researching low elevation uh, and then irrigates this crop, right? Um, and the circles with satellite imagery, uh, with Landsat, you cannot even see with the circle, but as you go and, and apply, for example, a planet has a three meter resolution and you can see some variability in the field now, right? And, and, and I'm hoping with a little bit more advances um, with Airbus, Airbus data or planet scope, which has 0.5 meter resolution, uh, we could literally see the variability in the field and then we can manage it. Uh, and and uh, again, then we can apply the drone or whatever else to go and do localized scout and, and, and see what the issue is, if that is the case. Uh, but again, just don't throw drone everywhere. That's what the message that I want to give it here, right? So. All right, so next slide, please. <clears throat> yeah, this is, uh, next slide, I talked about this. Um, yeah, and then in terms of data analytics, uh, you know, um, there are several platforms out there. Um, we, in our research, we use Pix4D. Um, uh, this is a Switzerland-based startup, uh, have a strong presence in, in US as well. And they have a range of, uh, you know, tools that are available for uh, stitching the aerial data. And, and making sense of that data as well, right? And there are some other like uh, tools that are there. Uh, if you are to do open source, um, in our research, we use QGIS. Um, this is open source ArcGIS kind of software. And again, but um, this is um, for, for us, what need to be understood is for research, you can use any tool, but for grower or farmer, um, there are not many tools available out there as of now that can crunch this data and everything. And then growers often get confused on how to proceed with, you can collect a lot of data, but how to you know, make sense of that data. Uh, there are not many uh, you know, simplified platforms available out for the growers uh, to use. So uh, for next few slides, I'm going to talk about some of the research case studies that we are doing. Can I have next slide, please? Okay, so I'll start with the case study where we are trying to use aerial imagery for uh, estimating what is called a high resolution EOP transpiration. And, and we think that can be used for doing precision irrigation management, right? And remember I talked about uh, in, in, in Washington state and some parts of the US, uh, we grow the crops uh, in circles because they're a little bit easy to manage and easy to irrigate with the central pivot irrigation system, right? For example, you can see this uh, potato circles in the in the state of Washington, Central Washington, in, in this image here, each circle is about 130 acres, and and so that's how you know you can lease this land or you can you know uh, have your own land and grow the crop, and here we use what is called central pivot, uh, and you can see the sprinklers dropping about mid elevation, and 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 irrigating the crop, and and you can autom automate the process. So circle goes around and irrigates the field for one day. And then you can have every other day or every few days, it goes back and each of the, um, the section of the circle can be controlled for variable rate irrigation, variable rate irrigation, uh, if, you, if you prefer to that, right? And again, the circle has ge ge like georeferencing the GPS receiver. So you know where the circle is and you can do the variable rate actuation as well. So uh, what we are trying to do here, next slide please, is, um, some of you already may know this. Um, there is a model called metric, right? M metric is nothing but mapping your transpiration at a high resolution with uh, internalized calibration. So Alan um, and, and some other researchers just adjacent to Washington State, Idaho State, they have developed this model for estimating ET, right? Um, now this model is developed to estimate ET at about say 30 meter per pixel resolution because it is, uses Landsat data, Landsat 7 or 8 data, right? Um, and so it's good for regional scale estimates and looking at the ET and all these things at regional scale. Um, uh, through this USDA funded project, what we are looking at is can we input the drone based imagery data or say in future, uh, which is not very distinct now, right? Uh, have satellite based imagery data going in here, the low orbiting satellite, and then still can estimate the resolution, the ET at say about 10 centimeter per pixel so that growers can see the, see the ET maps and then prescribe this uh, central pivots to do the variable rate irrigation and all, right? 
So that's what we are doing here. We are collecting multispectral data and thermal imagery data uh, and then modifying the metric model to estimate the ET for grapes, for potatoes, and for mint crop. Uh, that is kind of, you know, specialty crop in the state of Washington. Next slide, please. Yeah, and these are some of the results. We are comparing the ET estimates from the satellite and um, satellite is the Landsat 7 and 8 and we match uh, our imaging um, uh, frequency to the Landsat 7, 8 pass and see how we are doing in terms of estimating the ET. So next slide, please. Um, and this is another example of um, using the drone-based imagery and satellite-based imagery, the low orbiting satellite one, uh, for, is, for looking at the crop lodging, which is a big issue for mint crop that we grow here. And mint, if you can relate this to, you know, using the, the you know, mouth uh, rinse solutions that come out, or you have this uh, mints, that you, the paper mint that you eat. So we are like a number one in US to grow the mint crop. And the issue that we have in the state of Washington is, because of these irrigation sprinklers hitting the water as the crop is maturing, the, some of the crop will lodge uh, because this, you know the, the plant doesn't have much uh, strength to as it's 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 maturing, and and grower doesn't want to have that, and so we are trying to you know use the satellite or, or drone-based imagery to do the assessment of crop lodging, so grower can do differential harvest if it, if if it has to be that that if it has to be the case, and uh, and all that. So yeah. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, next slide. So this is drone-based imagery to look at the lodging. Yeah. And again, this is a simple example to show that um, you can also use high-resolution drone-based imagery to look at the crop stress. Uh, what you are seeing on the left here, top side, is multispectral imagery to show the stress in the, the pinto bean crop which received like less water in the central part and, and the side trip strips received like more water. Um, and the same thing with thermal imagery down there, what you are seeing here is um, you can see the stress, uh, like temperature elevation uh, in, the, in the plots that received less water compared to the side. And, and you can use, this is a just use case of, you know, how thermal imaging or multispectral imaging can be used um, in as you are doing the breeding or as you're doing the, you know, assessments on uh, crop stress uh, in your fields. Next slide, please. So uh, one other thing I wanted to touch base here is um, just besides, just, just, just instead of using the you know, uh, drone-based imagery for stress assess assessment, you can use what is called low cost or consumer grade drone, which is in the US, it's about $2,000, $2,500 that type of drone with a simple RGB sensor to also um, do the, you know, mapping of the canopies. And as I said, in Washington state, we have, uh, you know, apple, cherry, uh, grapes, pear, we have a range of these crops and growers need to decide, for example, how much application rate uh, he or she should have for a given growth stage, right? Um, you want to, you know, um, go and measure the canopy volume leaf wall area and all that. So instead of doing the point measurement, you can have a drone going and mapping your field and giving you this you know, specific uh, information about your block. And then you decide for this block, I want to have, have 100 gallon per acre at this growth stage. Next block, I have this kind of information. So I want to have 75 gallons per acre and all that. So this is another case study where we are trying to, you know, uh, do these measurements using a just consumer grade drone. Next slide, please. Um, in a, using this, you know, instead of single grid, we are using double grid mission and, and getting this kind of information. And this is what you are seeing here is a prescription map that, that kind of comes out after you get this, you know, canopy uh, mapping done, right? And, and you can pro literally fed this, if you have a variable rate technology, you can fed this into your rate controller and your sprayer will actuate the nozzles on the back just based on this map, if your system is compatible with this. Next slide, please. Uh, so a little bit on Internet of Things and artificial intelligence. Um, what we are doing, uh, as I said, um, in state of Washington, we have, you know, we are number one in fresh market apple production. And we are applying uh, some of the IoT or AI technologies here uh, for, to do something like um, what is shown here. We are trying to look at what is called apple sunburn, right? 
And as you may know, um, the climate change is real, right? And, and in state of Washington, in previous years, we used to have say about six times in a season, and I'm talking about apple production season, we have what is called, um, you know, days where we have high temperature, uh, like say 42 or above 42 degrees Celsius, and then the fruit that is on the, on the canopy will get burned. That's called sunburn, right? Um, nowadays, we have about 18 to 20 days in the season. As fruit is maturing, we get this fruit burn. And, and even the burns that, are, that is not visible, as you store the produce for about six to eight months and take out and sell in a fresh market, you lose about uh, 30 to 40% of the crop um, uh, in a given season, right? So there's a lot of, um, you know, stress factor and growers continuously apply what is called, you know, your operative cooling, as you see in the down slide here, a little bit. Uh, they apply this water continuously throughout the, you know, last four or five weeks just to maintain that climate. And that is not good in terms of food safety and all this, right? And so what we are trying to do is apply IOT aspect here. Next slide, please. Um, and in a nutshell, what we are doing is um, we are using, you know, thermal RGB imaging. And, and, and what you see on the top, you know, middle top there is you can see the thermal RGB imaging nodes. We're collecting data uh, of the fruit or, or number of fruits in the canopy. Uh, and, and, you know, we are using Raspberry Pi. This is a $40 computer uh, to analyze those images real time. And then uh, we plan to actuate uh, and this is the, the, the year two of this project, we plan to actuate the operative cooling when it's needed, right? And, and we are also supplementing this imagery information with what is called a microclimate sensor. This is Atmos 41, if you want to use it, this is a very good sensor. It measures about 14 climatic parameters, um, as you can see in one of the image, central image there. And, and we are using the, the, the modeling approach again to, to estimate what's, what is called fruit surface temperature. We are doing machine learning, on board the Raspberry Pi. And then uh, we want to actuate the operative cooling to manage the sunburn only when it's needed. Then, then, then running the operative cooling throughout the day, uh, just with our emotions, we want to you know, build some technology to, to do the management um, of the sunburn there. So that's what this project is about. So next slide, please. And then some growers came to us and say, hey, um, your technology is great and it will take some time to develop. Can you at least develop some application, a smart a smartphone application that we can use uh, in the field to look at our uh, crop sunburn and then we can probably actuate or not actuate manually um, the irrigation techniques, the operative cooling techniques. So we developed this app. Um, what it's doing is, you know, it uses this $400 uh, camera that goes on your, uh, underneath your smartphone and it takes the thermal image uh, real time analyzes the data on board and then tells the grower that this is your, uh, you know, in your field, this is the fruit surface temperature that is there. And it also pulls, you know, we have in Washington state, we have what is called Ag Weather Network. We have about like uh, 300 some stations. So it will pull the nearest weather station data and then estimate the fruit surface temperature using the microclimatic parameters or like the climatic parameters in this case and then tell, okay, this is what the FST is based on the climate and this is actual fruit surface temperature. Now you decide what to do with your UR produce cooling. And, and, and then, yeah, that's what this app is doing. And yeah, so next slide, please. Um, and then again, you can use some of this technology for monitoring, you know, we have several issues um, um, in, in the crops we grow here, uh, the frost damage is a big one, uh, specifically, you know, this month or, or last month, uh, you know, uh, days are warming, but early mornings it's cold and the birds are coming out on the trees, uh, they get frost damage. And so you can monitor those using thermal imaging techniques that, that were discussed just before and, and probably manage better. Um, yeah, so next slide, please. So for next, five minutes or so, I just want to focus a little bit on uh, the management side. And this again, going back to the management of tree fruit crops or grape wines, because that's what our projects are on, right? Um, so management is, is, I mean, variable rate technology is not new. Um, next slide, please. We have seen uh, probably, that's this, well, that's not the slide, but um, we have seen like there are several types of variable rate technologies that are developed. Um, when I was in Florida, we developed variable rate sprayer, what's called precision sprayer. 
There's a group in Ohio who has developed intelligence prayer that's already in the market and all that, right? So why we need that uh, is what this slide is talking about, right? Uh, and this is probably of interest to some of you, right? Um, in India, I'm not sure how the apples are grown, but in here, previously we used to have these bulky trees, you know, uh, you know that, that fruit trees. We are changing the orchard systems now. And what you see in the middle slide, most of our crop production, the apple crop production is gone from bulky trees to modern orchard systems where the fruits are grown as a fruiting wall, right? It's about, you know, five feet, um, well, not five feet, five meter um, fruiting wall. Uh, it's easy to manage, easy to um, harvest and all these things. And for this, we need what is called um, a different type of uh, technique to apply the chemicals, not the traditional air blast spraying, um, because you can see the drift coming out of these orchards with the air blast sprayer. Uh, also, you know, as we manage insect and pests, as I said before, uh, there are issues with MRLs. Um, nowadays, consumers are a little bit um, on the sensitive side of, you know, how much pests are I'm eating. And there is a survey out by CDC that says that if you sample uh, American blood, um, on average, depending on what you eat, there, there would be about 29 pesticides in our body and all that. So we need to be a little bit uh, sensitive about how we apply the chemicals and how we grow. And that's what, uh, you know, some of our projects are dealing with. Next slide, please. Um, and so this, this slide was uh, what I was talking about. There are a range of techniques that we have, you know, already developed uh, in terms of developing precision sprayers. Um, uh, the precision sprayers, again, can use LIDAR or ultra ultrasonic sensor and actuate the rear side of the, of the air blast sprayer. Uh, it, it can also have prescription map fed in and then actuate the nozzles on the back. So there are a range of techniques that are out there. Uh, next slide, please. And that can be used for um, uh, precision you know, chemical application. Next slide, I'll skip the video that is here. Um, this is a sprayer that we developed when I was in Florida in collaboration with Carnegie Mellon, uh, but I'm not gonna play the video. Can I have next slide, please? Yeah. So what you're seeing here is the sprayer that is developed by USDA ARS in Ohio. And we are, we are trying to optimize this for the crops like apples or you know, grapes here in, in the state of Washington. And already Smart Guided Systems is a company based in, in um, uh, Illinois. They're already marketing this as a retrofit uh, to any commercial sprayer that's out there. And so with a retrofit, you make your air blast sprayer as an intelligent sprayer. And, and then several growers in the state of Washington already have this technique for about $30,000, $35,000. You can get this sprayer, made it, you can make a sprayer retrofit and, and so on. And so, uh, this technology is already matured to some extent, uh, and then and a lot of growers are already using this in, in Washington, in Calif in not California, but in Florida, where there is a lot of need um, to do the precision uh, chemical application. Uh, this is already out there. So next slide, please. So, um, but again, the, the air blast sprayers that, that are used uh, don't uh, cover everything. Uh, we still have issue with drift. We still have issue with human exposure. If uh, you know the growers are the, 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 the not growers, but the labor people are working in the field, um, uh, we can still have exposure. And also, it, we have to depend on the ground conditions, right, uh, to apply these chemicals. In, in and when we talk talk about ground conditions in the state of Washington, we have um, average grower will have about 500 acres, and he or she cannot wait too much uh, for the ground conditions to become better. Uh, on you know on a days when there is a lot of insect or pest pressure, so we have to have some alternate technologies to apply the chemicals. And the next slide probably talks about this uh, to some extent. So what we are doing, and this is eight years in running, we are working with Michigan State University, and uh, what we are developing is what is called solid set canopy delivery system. It's a it's a fixed spray system. Uh, in a nutshell, just think of this as an irrigation or sprinkler irrigation in your uh, field. Uh, here, what we are doing is we have this solid set optimized for your canopies. It could be apple canopy or your grape wine canopy. And, and then it's, 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 um, this solid set is there. And then um, you, the, on the day you want to apply the chemicals, you take your applicator unit that's shown on the left of your slide um, and then you just connect this applicator to the solid set 
and just playing with the pressure and so on, you can apply the chemical within like few minutes, you can apply entire block of like say 30 or 40 acres and then go to next block. And so you can play with the weather. For example, you know, when you use air blast sprayer, um, you have to keep spraying because you cannot wait for weather to improve and all that. Uh, but with this, you can wait for right wind condition, right, uh, you know, wind speed and so on uh, to avoid the inversion factors and all this. And then just spray your block when the wind and weather is right. So you have less drift and more targeted chemical application. So uh, we have done a lot of publications on in this domain. And right now we are talking with Gen USA and Netafim, some of the local companies uh, in the, you know, um, in the US uh, to, to commercialize these systems. So I will, I'll, I'll stay at that one. Next slide, please. Yeah, so I'll skip this one. So we have, this is talking about advancements in SSCDS again. Um, next slide, please. So uh, two minutes on aerial transition, what's happening in terms of uh, using drones for chemical application. Next slide, please. So, um, and you, you probably know some of this already, right? So there are several small drones that can be used for applying, you know, chemicals. And, and because you can do mapping uh, with drones, you can do surgical applications um, when it's, you know, where, where drone goes and applies chemical where it's needed. Uh, in China, this is like four years back when I was there, they're already having like, you know, 10 drones and, and one operator going back and forth and applying the chemicals in, in Apple block that is there. Um, in U.S. market, however, we need something called mid-size unmanned aircraft systems. Again, that's to do with the scale of our operations, right? Um, we have 200 plus acre um, of Apple block or something. We cannot use small unmanned aircraft systems to apply the chemicals. And so we have some other players. We have um, played with what is called um, mid-size drone. Uh, you can see on the top, top right here. This is from Yamaha. Uh, it's R-Max and they have a new model now, Phaser. It's a mid-size and you can use it again, just like in Indian context, you can use small drone for doing precision spraying or surgical spraying. We can use mid-size drone for doing pre the surgical spraying, again, because of the acreage issue. You cannot have the like, you know, uh, 16 liter tanks on either side of the drone uh, doing all the acreage. So you can just use for spot spraying or something. And, and, and there, you know, again, growers have expressed a lot of need of this technology, but um, that has not trust translated uh, to some extent to the agriculture. And, and we are not new to ma manufacturing drones in US at least, right? And it, it's been used in the Department of Defense. Some of that technology need to be translated in US agriculture for chemical application. And that's not been done effectively as of today. So next slide, please. Um, and, and this is just to talk about drones can also be used for spreading. And, and in, in Washington state, we have a project um, where we are using on the, on the left, well, on the right, actually, what you see here is a drone that can be used to spray the beneficial insects. And, and through the beneficial insect release, um, uh, the Canada, the, the British Columbia and the Washington state, uh, they are working in collaboration here uh, to do integrated pest management. And, and they do the mapping with the, the traps in the orchards and all that, and then surgically release these beneficial insects in the areas where the pest management need to happen effectively. And, and that's a very good, I think, approach of doing integrated pest management to, um, to the drone technology. Next slide, please. Uh, this is probably my uh, last slide on the drone. Um, again, I, I talked about some of this. For US agriculture and the scale that we have here, drones are not feasible for applying chemicals for following reasons. And there is a study out there uh, we spray for about 30% of the time and then 70% of the time is gone on ground operation. That would be filling the tanks and getting the drone back to where it is and all that thing, right? Also, there is not so much standardization in terms of airframes, the amount of down wash that is going and, and creating the effective deposition and all these things. Um, and the nozzles that are that, that we are putting underneath um, to spray, they are not you know standardized and all these things. So several things need to be researched and, and optimized before we take this technology uh, for practical applications in, in US agriculture. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next slide, I'll skip this one. So um, what is near future? 
uh, and this could we can take this as a concluding slide or I have one more. Um, uh, you know, it's an exciting future uh, for all of us. As I said, Airbus is in the domain of launching low orbiting satellites. And, and um, we have been on a Microsoft campus in Seattle where Microsoft is working with Airbus uh, to integrate this satellite data and how this, uh, their machine learning cloud and everything come together and they can provide some service to, grow, to growers, uh, at least in the state of Washington, uh, so that we can use that information, right? Uh, that's one domain. So there's a lot of uh, in, you know, data that is coming on without having your platforms going in the field is one aspect. The other one is John Deere, right? John Deere it teamed up with a company in Europe. You can see the downside, and this was exp you know, um, uh, demoed in Agrotechnica uh, Agri in Germany, which is a, one of the biggest event uh, on the agricultural equipments. Uh, this particular platform, as you see in the right side, bottom right side, this is the drone that carries a you know, little bit more payload and you can spray a little bit wider uh, swath so that it, you, know, you can cover larger acreage and all that. So if John Deere is thinking about this, Airbus, Microsoft thinking about this, um, that's a good news for at least um, uh, for, for the growers uh, that are worried about uh, who is the lead player uh, when it comes to developing and marketing these technologies, right? So next slide, please. And yeah. please conclude. Yes, so, and, and I will just skip this one, please. The last slide is there. And I, I like this cartoon that you see here. Next slide, please. Um, the future is there. I just want to say one last thing as my concluding remark. Next slide, remark. Next slide please. I'll skip this one as well. And, and so this is where we need to go. Um, we need to not only talk about optical sensors and drones and everything um, and, and monitor and say we can get this good imagery and all that thing, right? We need to talk about management. And unless that is done, unless the technology is translated to monitor and manage, um, we are going to see what you are seeing here. We are, you know, we are applying so much fungicide, pesticide, herbicide. Uh, literally now COVID is going on, but literally down the line, um, we are going to have genocide thanks to all the chemicals that we put in as we produce the, the you know, high yielding you know, crops. We need to focus on the quality and the management is critical for all that. So with that, I want to stop here. Um, I'm not sure uh, how much time I took. I'm sorry for the delay in the, um, from my side because of the, my you know, headphone thing, yeah. So thanks again for the opportunity and good to see some of you. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. 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 Dr. Lau, I think uh, you did a wonderful job. I think we are really thankful to you uh, for having woken you up at 4.30 and you spent the time for all of us uh, to make us learn some new technology. I think we are indebted for you. I think uh, we will take a few questions. Uh, I will take two questions. Anybody has, please, uh, hand, please. I have yeah, a please. small question. Uh, yeah. Sir, it's about the apple sunburn um, that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, so I wanted to know what kind of sensors you're using in the apple sunburn. Make sure. sure. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll get to that, but I want to say sorry to Dr. Nachiket if I have taken your time. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, you, you, yeah. you have set a, pre a precursor for me in the next day. Okay. I'll start okay. very late. Okay. Um, so, yeah, the... We are using you know, different types of sensors. One is of course uh, uh, the microclimate sensor that measures 14 weather parameters. And, and we have set those sensors, the microclimate weather stations in the Apple block, right? That measures 14 parameters. Again, um, Washington state, like we have ag weather network. We used to have these bulky weather stations. Now they are transitioning from those bulky weather stations to these small atmos based infield measurement sensors, right? That's one thing that we are using. The other thing that is we are using is imaging based sensors. So imaging, we have a um, thermal imaging sensor. Um, you can get a lepton camera that is about $300 and you can you know, integrate that with your uh, Raspberry Pi computer. We also have RGB imaging sensor. And so with that, we get a perspective of the fruit and then get the, the you know, fruit isolated from the background and they then get the temperature of the fruit. And that's, you can get a fruit temperature. That's the best thing 
because weather is always you know different at different locations within orchard yeah thank you i would request now dr indramani to introduce the next speaker please i think yes. time thank you thank you dr lok thank you uh, yeah now we have uh, dr nachiket uh, kotwali wale he is uh, head uh, agro produce processing division at cia bhopal sari nachiket actually it is uh, you know this session updated uh, you know delayed uh, 